Welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha, a podcast shared by David Roylance. This podcast is dedicated to guiding you to completely eliminate the discontent mind and the suffering it causes by attaining enlightenment. Learn and practice the teachings of Gotama Buddha that will guide you to fully attain a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. To support this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha or visit buddhadailywisdom.com where you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online learning resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Now, here's our teacher to share more. Sawadikap, hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today is our group learning program and we're studying chapter 23 of our book, Developing a Life Practice, The Path That Leads to Enlightenment. This chapter is titled Symbolism of the Teachings, Reminders Through Imagery. This is where you're going to be learning about certain images that are used in artwork, in temple construction, in architecture, and different things like this that are helping you to remember the teachings. We're going to be talking about this after our meditation because it's going to really help you when you're visiting temples or when you're looking at artwork or you're seeing different symbols to help remind you about the teachings. Because during the lifetime of the Buddha, they didn't have any words in terms of writing to be able to have books and things like this. So they used symbols in order to help you remember the teachings. So now that students in this program have been learning with me for almost seven months, it's an ideal time to teach you some of the symbolism of the teachings. So welcome to all of you, whether you're joining for the first time or you're joining regularly. This is a really fun class because we're going to be looking at some pictures and discussing this various symbolism. If you'd like to join for our meditation, which we start each one of our classes with meditation, you're more than welcome. You might pull up a meditation cushion or a chair or anything like that where you can do seated, lying, standing. We don't usually do walking on online learning, but if someone has the ability to do that, you're more than welcome to do walking meditation. I'll give you a little bit of guidance on the seated position where you'd like to just have your legs lightly crossed, maybe sitting on the floor with a cushion under your rear. That will help the circulation flow in the lower body. If you would like to put your legs off the mat, this can be helpful as well because it lessens the angle at the hips, the knees, and the ankles. The Buddha put his right hand over his left with his thumbs together and you might decide to put that into your lap but there's other options here as well because it's not about everyone doing it exactly the same way. Some people like to put their palms on their thighs or their knees or their palms up. Some people even just rest their hands comfortably in their lap. So whatever is comfortable for you with the lower body and hands and arms feel free to do that. The upper body should be erect. This keeps the mind attentive and alert during the meditation so that you can actively train the mind. So I'm going to ease us into meditation with some chanting, which you guys are welcome to join along in. Then I'll be back with some guidance. There's going to be a period of time where it's just quiet and we're meditating together. And then we're going to come out of the meditation with some chanting. Arahant Savakato Mahakavata Tamo Damang Namasami Supatipano Mahakavato Sawaka Sanko Sanghang Namami Napur Sabhakawato Arahato Sama Saputasa Napur Sabhakawato Arahato Sama 
มพุทธาสานับมรหาสาภาเกวะโตอาระหโตสัมมาสัมพุทธาสาอิติปิสุมหาเกวะอาระหังสัมมาสัมมุตโตวิชาจารณังสัมมุโนสัคคโตโรกาวิตุอนุเตโรปุริสัดามาสติสัตตาวามนุสนังพุตโตภาควัตเคทบอดีและหัวใจสงบสุขและหัวใจบนท้องเปิดปิดตาและเริ่มเดินออกจากหน้าจอและเดินออกจากหน้าจอและเดินออกจากหน้าจอและเดินออกจากหน้าจอและเดินออกจากหน้าจอ A nice, natural, steady, consistent breath. Not forced or controlled. Just a gradual inhale through the nose, experiencing the full breath. And then, whenever you're ready, exhale out through the nose. Breathing in and out. Breathing in and out. Your breath may not match up with the guidance that I'm providing, and that's okay. This is your practice. I'm just here for guidance. You can use this voice as a reminder that whenever you get to the next inhale, breathing gradually through the nose, developing a nice, natural, steady, consistent breath. And then, whenever you're ready, exhale out through the nose, experiencing the full breath. Breathing in and out. Breathing in. And out. With the breath well established, start fixating the mind on the breath. Either the sound of the breath coming into the nose, or the sensation of air moving over the skin into the nose. The breath is the present moment. Fixate the mind. On the breath, the present moment. Breathing in and out. Breathing in. And out. 
with the mind fixated on the breath, whenever you notice that it moves off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. No need to observe the thought, label it, judge it, analyze it, or even try to figure out where it's coming from. Whenever you notice that the mind is moved off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. Breathing in. And out. Breathing in and out. I'm going to be quiet now and let you do this work of focusing on the breath, cutting off and letting go anytime the mind moves off the breath. You have nowhere to go. There's nothing to do. No one needs you right now. This is your time to focus on the breath. Breathing in and out.
to slowly make your way out of meditation. Once again, I'd like to welcome all of you to our class today, whether you're joining for the first time or you're joining regularly, or maybe you joined us since we started meditating. Welcome to everyone. Our class today is Symbolism of the Teachings, Reminders Through Imagery. This is chapter 23 of our book, Developing a Life Practice, The Path That Leads to Enlightenment. In this chapter, I share various symbols with you that are going to help you to be able to understand how they use symbols during the lifetime of the Buddha to remember the teachings. During the lifetime of the Buddha, everything that he taught was oral. They didn't have the technology to write things down. We might not think of this as technology, but 2,500 years ago, it was technology just to be able to write things down. And that didn't exist in that region of the world where the Buddha lived, which is what we refer to as Northeast India. Instead, this technology existed in China, but it hadn't made its way over to that region of the world yet. So the language that the Buddha spoke in was strictly an oral tradition. It didn't even have a script with it because there wasn't a need for a script. So scripts weren't even invented for certain languages at that time during the history of humanity. So what the Buddha would do is students would come and they would learn with him and he would speak orally and help them to understand the teachings. But then he would use various symbols to be able to help people to remember what it is that he taught. So maybe if you saw a certain symbol on the side of a barn and you were walking down the street and you looked up and you saw that, then it could remind you of something that you had already learned with the Buddha. So now that you guys have learned the teachings with me for nearly seven months, some of you, of course, some of you joined at other times during the program, but if you've been learning the teachings for any length of time, there are certain teachings that you've now learned that you can look at symbols and you can understand how these are being represented in symbols. And where this is beneficial for you is that when you see artwork, or you visit temples or things like this, it can remind you of the teachings. And this can be one of the really fun things to do, which is to visit temples and to be able to 
see some of the symbolism that's embedded in these temples. Where I live in Thailand, there's some temples that are anywhere from 500 to 1,000 years old. And when you enter into these temples, you're entering into an environment which is essentially a community center. But you can also think of it like a library, that the walls will speak to you, the artwork will speak to you if you understand some of the symbols. And this can be really fun to visit a temple because the artist and the craftspeople who were crafting these temples 500 to 1,000 years ago, they were embedding the teachings into the walls and into the architecture and into the artwork. And now when you visit, it can help remind you of the teachings. And this is a pastime that Thai people do. When they go on holiday, for example, if you're from Chiang Mai and say you go to Phuket, for holiday, you might end up visiting a few temples while you're there and you walk around and you look and see what it is that they have on the temples. Because I haven't ever been to any two temples that are exactly the same. The Thai people and people who are practicing Buddhist teachings will typically understand a bit about impermanence because this is such an important teaching to understand the universal truth of impermanence. They're not trying to create all their temples to look exactly the same. Instead, when you walk into a temple, you'll see different things that are going to help you and remind you of the teachings. It's almost like a scavenger hunt going around and actually viewing these images and artwork and things like this. So I'm going to share some of these with you, some of the real common ones that you will see. And I'll talk you guys through this. And as you guys have questions, you're welcome to ask those. You can put those into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom in the comment section. I'll be able to answer your questions. In Zoom, you can electronically raise your hand and ask any and all questions that you like. If you're listening to this on the pure audio, I would suggest that you look for a book or you go to the website and download the slides that we have there that are going to help you to be able to see the images. Because some people, when you're listening to this, you might be listening just to the pure audio of this class. And in that case, you're going to need the images to be able to see and understand what it is that I'm teaching you. And they show up in our book, Developing a Life Practice, The Path That Leads to Enlightenment, Volume 1, Chapter 23. And you can download this from our website at buddhadailywisdom.com. You can also get printed versions of it through Amazon or at the temple and places like this because it's going to be really helpful for you to see these images. And I even have this particular slides that I use for all of the various programs in PDF format on our website, same website, buddhadailywisdom.com. If you click on free books and scroll down towards the bottom, you'll see all the slides that I use for the various courses and retreats and programs and things like this. So let's jump into looking at these images and have some fun discussing these things because now that you guys have maybe learned some of the teachings, you'll be able to understand what these images are and what they're representing. This first one is a representation of enlightenment. I'm talking about the one in the middle. The others are as well, but let's talk about the one in the middle to get us started. This one in the middle is a very common one that you'll see that people will use to represent enlightenment in your journey to enlightenment because it's representing the path that you walk as you're making your way towards enlightenment. The image starts right here where my pointer is, right in the middle. And essentially what it's doing is it's wrapping around, circling around and around and around, and then you're making your way forward. As this is circling around and around and around, this is representing an individual in the cycle of rebirth, continually being reborn over and over and over and over and over and over again. And if you notice here, this part of the line is very thick and very dark because that's where we're in the darkness. We lack wisdom. So we do things like maybe killing or stealing, sexual misconduct, lying, taking substances that cause heedlessness and things like this. We are bitter and harsh and hostile to people. We don't know how to solve our problems. We struggle and have difficulties in that unenlightened state. So all those different realms that we're being reborn into, we're being reborn countless times over and over and over again. And that's being represented by the circling of this image. But then at a certain point, we start to get access to the teachings and we start walking forward and notice that we're starting to move upwards. And notice how the line is becoming more and more narrow because there's less and less darkness because we're cultivating more and more wisdom and we're fine tuning and focusing in on the teachings that it takes to get to enlightenment. But even though we're walking forward and upwards, notice how there's these 
backwards regressions. This is the mind, how you can be walking forward on the path to enlightenment and you can intellectually know what's wise, perhaps, that it would be wise for you to do in any situation, but the mind just won't do it because it doesn't have the wisdom and it hasn't eliminated enough pollution. So there's like these back steps or this misunderstandings that lead to regression in your practice and as you're making those back steps what's important is that you cultivate wisdom so that you can overcome those so if you're having any missteps just understand that you can reach out to me for help you can consult all the resources that i share because you're going to experience this it's not a linear progression to enlightenment sometimes we think we start and then we're just going to have this linear progression upwards towards enlightenment but instead you can see here that there's these back steps and now you make your way forward more because you've cultivated some wisdom during that time when you're struggling and having difficulties in these little rings here that's the opportunity to cultivate wisdom and if you take that opportunity to cultivate wisdom when you're struggling and having difficulties you can experience some more forward progress but then there's going to be some more missteps you're going to be kind of walking backwards again you're going to have some regression but then again if you use that opportunity to reach out and get help and cultivate wisdom you're going to have some more forward progress and now you keep doing the same thing where you're cultivating wisdom you're having some more forward progress again having missteps cultivating wisdom have more forward progress and notice as we're moving upward it's narrowing in it's coming in closer and closer and closer and closer so as it's coming in closer and closer and closer we're refining what we're doing and we're narrowing in on the teachings that it takes to get to enlightenment before eventually we get the teachings that we need and now the mind is actually enlightened so that's what this is representing i refer to this as the na there's other ways to refer to this because the universal truth of impermanence different people will refer to it in different ways this is a very common thing that you'll see in artwork there's these fans that the ordained practitioners have sometimes they're on there you might see it on a statue of the buddha they'll put it in between the eyebrows on the forehead this is called the third eye when the third eye or the divine eye or the inward looking eye is awakening you start to be more introspective and you start looking inwards instead of looking outward externally for all the problems that people are causing you instead you look inward and figure out what is it inside the mind that is causing these difficulties and struggles you look inward for those cravings desires attachments so this na is oftentimes placed at the third eye on the statue of the buddha representing the opening of this inward looking eye and enlightenment that a being is actually enlightened so you'll see this sometimes in artwork but then because artists are very creative and they're typically trying to represent things in different ways and they will create different things there's different variations of this type of symbol there's other ones that you can see that are essentially representing the same thing but in a slightly different way because artists are always very creative and looking for ways to represent things differently so these ones that i have on the side these are ones that i had never seen before but when i was looking around to do this chapter i started looking for other symbols to see what was out there and of course i knew because of impermanence there was going to be other things so here you can see these other symbols that are essentially representing the same thing which is this winding and twirling and this narrowing in on the teachings this backstepping as you're making your way forward so let me know if you guys have any questions on this particular image or what we've been talking about here you can put that into facebook youtube or zoom or you can raise your hand in zoom and ask any questions that you like Okay, looks like Vibhav has a question. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, David. I was wondering in the symbol on, I guess, my left here, it shows the Om symbol, which is added to, to the enlightenment. So this looks like a later addition with the integration of Hinduism, some Hindu, I guess, symbols into the enlightenment. Yeah, people can be influenced from any number of things. You know, artists typically get different influences and they may or may not even know where they're being influenced by these things, but it's very possible that that's the case. These aren't things that I've seen in common use throughout Thailand and things like this. This one that I use in the center, this is the one that I show because this is the very common one that you'll see. But these other ones are ones that artists have created. And the only place I've ever seen them is when I was searching on Google for images of enlightenment. I saw these, so that's why I use these here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Okay, let me see if we have any other questions anywhere. 
All right, I'm not seeing any other questions anywhere. So let's move to the next one. And this is another common one that you'll see throughout temples and artwork and things like this. I refer to this one as the Dhamma wheel. The word Dhamma is just the Pali word, which means the teachings. But in order to say this in English, you would say the teachings wheel, essentially. And this doesn't actually really communicate anything meaningful, so I tend to not use that terminology. Instead, I refer to it as the Dhamma wheel. So let me explain to you what it means and some different information about this Dhamma wheel. Looking at this one over here on your left of the screen, you can see this circle. This is going around in a circle, and then you see these eight individual spokes. Okay, what this is representing is this circle is representing the cycle of rebirth and how each being is in this cycle of rebirth, continuously being reborn over and over and over again. And then what you learn on the path to enlightenment is the escape from that is the eightfold path. And that's represented by these eight individual spokes that are part of the wheel. This one that's at 12 o'clock, this is representing right view. Then we've got right intention. At three o'clock, we've got right speech. Then we've got right action. At six o'clock, we've got right livelihood. Then we've got right effort. At nine o'clock, we've got right mindfulness. And then we've got right concentration. These are the eight factors or the eight steps of the Eightfold Path that you're going to need to learn and practice to train the mind to eradicate any kind of pollution, uprooting that out of the mind and moving the mind to enlightenment. And having moved the mind to enlightenment, not only is the mind peaceful and joyful permanently, but you'll no longer experience any discontentedness or rebirth in the cycle of rebirth. So that's what this is representing for you. Here it's as a temple marker, but you can show up in lots of other places as well in artwork and different things like this. And what it said is that this Dhamma wheel or this wheel that you're looking at, or you might refer to it as a teachings wheel if you'd like, it's at the head of the Buddha. So that a Buddha, when they awaken from enlightenment, that they reach up and they actually turn this Dhamma wheel. It's not a physical thing on the head of a Buddha, but it's figuratively there. Where the skull is, on the top and on the back of the skull, you've got a flat spot on the head of a Buddha and they will reach up with their right hand and they will turn this wheel counterclockwise when they awaken to enlightenment. And what this is signifying is humanity stepping forward and entering into a new era or a new civilization. Because a Buddha coming into the world means that the teachings that it takes to be able to get to enlightenment are very profound in the world. They're going to be shining in the world because a Buddha is going to have deep wisdom about the path to enlightenment. And they're going to be able to bring the teachings into the world in such a way that they can really shine. So having a Buddha in the world and living during that lifetime would be the very best and most ideal time time to be alive because the teachings are going to be shining in the world in such a way that makes it much more easy for you to be able to get to enlightenment. So this Dhamma wheel is a symbol of entering into a new era and a new civilization. And it's also representing that cycle of rebirth in the escape of that, which is the eightfold path. So oftentimes, because of what I just described with you, this Dhamma wheel, not only is it used as temple markers like this, but you'll sometimes see this in artwork or in statues and stuff like this behind the head of a Buddha. So here you can see me standing talking to a student in the picture in the middle. And behind me, you can see that there's two statues. And this one statue here has a Dhamma wheel behind it. This Dhamma wheel is being placed at the behind the head of a Buddha because of what I just described to you, that this is where it's usually placed. But you can see it in other places as well. Like over here, you can see that there's a temple marker with a Dhamma wheel as well. So these eight individual spokes are representing the escape because the Eightfold path is the way to escape out of this unenlightened state and get out of the cycle of rebirth so that you can now enter into this mental state of the enlightened mind. So let me know what questions you guys have here. You can put those into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can raise your hand in Zoom and ask any questions that you like. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions here. So I'm going to move on to the next one. This is a lotus flower, and this is very common in Buddhist artwork and in temples. You'll see lots of lotus flowers typically. So I'm going to explain to you what this is because it's representing, once again, your journey to enlightenment. This 
open lotus flower, the bloom lotus flower, is actually representing the enlightenment. But let me explain to you how the lotus flower grows in case you're not familiar with this because it's representing your journey to enlightenment. A lotus flower has these roots that are deep down into the murky earth. It's usually growing in a pond and the roots are down into the murky earth. And then it's got to grow this strong stalk to move through this murky water of the pond. And then once it grows that strong stalk, it rises above the murky water and then it blooms into a lotus flower. And this is essentially the journey that you're taking on the path to enlightenment. Because as we're in the cycle of rebirth and unaware of these teachings, our mind is holding on to the world, just like those roots of the lotus flower. It's holding on to the earth and to the world. But then we need to grow this strong stalk or this strong practice. Growing your practice is to develop your wisdom of the path to enlightenment. Yes, including meditation, but other things as well that you need to learn in order to grow that strong stalk or that strong practice. Now to move through that murky water, which is representing the murkiness of the world. Because the world is into maybe killing or stealing, sexual misconduct, lying, intoxicants, things like this and others, being harsh and bitter and hostile, festering, struggling, having bitterness and hostility towards people, talking in impolite, unkind and disrespectful ways to people. You're going to need to move through all that through a strong practice. Yes, of meditation, but you're going to need to know each individual aspect of the Eightfold Path in order to build that strong practice to move through the murky water of the world. And then as you do that, you'll rise above the water and then ultimately you can bloom like a lotus flower. So you'll ultimately see this particular symbolism used around the Buddha statues and things like this, that whenever you see a bloom lotus flower, it's representing enlightenment. So oftentimes they carve a lotus flower at the bottom of a statue of the Buddha in order to represent enlightenment. He didn't literally sit on lotus flowers, but instead it's just representing enlightenment. And you'll see these around in different places like temples and things like that or even just people in their house, they can have lotus flowers and things. So a bloom lotus flower is representing enlightenment. But when you see a closed lotus flower, like this one on the top, this is a lotus flower that hasn't bloomed yet. So when you see a closed lotus flower, this is representing your potential that you have to be able to get to enlightenment, that you can get to enlightenment. You have the potential to do it, but not every lotus flower is going to bloom. If you go to a pond and maybe there's 500 or 1,000 different lotus flowers, not all of them are going to bloom. Some of them will, but some of them won't. Some of them will grow that strong stalk and come up over the water, and they'll just sit there and stay closed the entire time. Some of them won't quite break through the water. They might be underneath of the water. You can see that here with this one down towards the bottom. There's one that's kind of still under the water. So it's growing that strong stalk or that strong practice, your wisdom of the path to enlightenment that's going to help you rise above the water. And then ultimately, you need to bloom into this lotus flower. So this can be a great reminder for you of your potential that you have to be able to get to enlightenment now that you're in this human realm. So any questions on this one? Again, you can put that into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or raise your hand in Zoom and ask any questions that you like. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions anywhere. So let's move to this one. This one is one that I also saw when I was writing this chapter and looking at different images and stuff like this. I ran across it and I thought it was a great representation of something that I'd like to share with you. As you're learning the images and what represents the various teachings of the Buddha, not only are you going to see the ones that I've been teaching you, but you're going to see other ones as well that people have just created artists are, like I mentioned, very creative and they'll create all different kinds of images. So even though I didn't teach you about specific images, you can actually use the knowledge and the wisdom of the ones that I'm sharing with you. And any ones that you see that you haven't actually seen and that you haven't actually learned before, you can kind of decipher what it means. So like when you go out to temples or you look at artwork and things like this, the specific images that you see I haven't taught you all of them and you won't be learning all of them as part of this particular class. But from the basic ones that I'm teaching you, you can look at some of these other ones that you're seeing based on the creativity of the artist and kind of figure out what it is that they're trying to communicate. So like this one here, you might actually be able to figure out already what it's representing because this artist, whoever created this one, you can see that they're using that na where it's going around and around and around. And now they're representing your journey to enlightenment. And then they put a bloom lotus flower here at the top. 
So this is representing enlightenment. So if I saw this anywhere in any kind of artwork, I could tell that the artist is trying to represent the journey to enlightenment and enlightenment itself. So you're going to see certain images like this that you've never learned before and I haven't exposed you to or you haven't come across before, but you can figure it out based on the things that you do know about the teachings of the Buddha. You might see things that are representing the four stages of enlightenment or the five precepts or any number of things like this that you've learned as part of these teachings. So now let me share this one with you. This is actually a very common thing that you'll see at temples, which is this large statue of a snake at the base of the stairs of a temple. Here were these students that I'm with were at a temple called Wat Doi Satep. This is on a mountain in Chiang Mai, Thailand. And this snake here is at the base of the stairs. And then you can see a smaller one over here at this particular building. But you can see these snakes at many, many, many different temples. They'll have these typically at the base of the stairs or right before you enter into the main building of the temple. They'll sometimes have them there as well. So I'm going to share with you this story of where this comes from and why they're being used. And as I share this story with you, it's helpful to understand that I don't know whether this story is true or false. It is in the original Pali canon, but it could be true and it could be false. I don't know because the story is quite mystical and quite magical. And there's certain lessons that you can extrapolate from this story. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you the story as I know it from the Pali canon, but then I'll help you to extrapolate lessons from it and just understand that I don't know whether it's true or false because as you hear, it's pretty mystical, magical story. The story is that during the lifetime of the Buddha, that there was this large snake like this that we might refer to as a Naga or the king of the serpents or something like this. And this particular snake was able to transition itself to look like a human being. And what it would do is it would transition itself to look like a monk, an ordained practitioner with a robe and a shaved head and things like this. And it would go into where the Buddha was actually teaching in order to learn the teachings because it was interested in getting to enlightenment. And as it was sitting there listening to the teachings, as was common, oftentimes people would fall asleep during the discourses of the Buddha. Now, you might consider that to be rude or disrespectful, but that's not actually the case. If somebody needs to sleep, then so be it. Not everybody's going to be awake during a class. That's the universal truth of impermanence. As you're learning these teachings, it can be very challenging for the mind. There's a lot of effort and energy put into understanding the teachings as you're learning them. So even as you first started learning with me, you might have noticed that your mind was having to work really hard because your mind didn't understand these teachings. And you might have find that it's very challenging in some situations to really learn these teachings and the mind has to work really hard. So as people would be learning with the Buddha and he would have these really long discourses, people would sometimes fall asleep. This wasn't uncommon. And when this would occur and everybody fall asleep, the Buddha would just wait for people to wake back up and then he would start teaching again. But as the snake fell asleep amongst all the other ordained practitioners who were human beings, it lost a certain level of its consciousness. Because when you're awake, you have a certain level of consciousness. But when you're asleep, that isn't really there. So as this being fell asleep, it actually transitioned and looked back like a snake again. This large snake was among the ordained practitioners. And as the ordained practitioners were starting to wake up and they saw this snake, they were scared. They were fearful. So they went and got the Buddha. And they brought the Buddha over to where the snake was. And the Buddha, seeing the snake, he wasn't afraid. Because enlightened beings don't have any fear. They've eliminated all the causes and conditions that produce fear. So as the Buddha came over to where this snake was and saw the snake lying there, the snake started to wake up. And as the snake woke up, the Buddha started talking to the snake and saying, Hey, you know, what, what are you doing here? You know, why would you come in to where I'm teaching and asking the snake various questions? And the snake shares with the Buddha that he would like to get to enlightenment. He would like to learn his teachings. And the Buddha politely let him know that it's not possible for him to get to enlightenment from the animal realm. But because he can transition himself to look like a human being, he must be very close to being reborn into the human realm. So that when he was reborn into the human realm, that would be the ideal time for him to learn and understand and practice the teachings to be able to get to enlightenment. And the snake understood this. And the Buddha asked him if he could go outside because the ordained practitioners were having all this fear and it was important for the Buddha to be able to teach them so that they could get to enlightenment. And the snake 
decided to go outside and he told the Buddha, he said, okay, if you're not going to let me learn the teachings of the Buddha, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to stand outside. I'm going to stand guard. This is why they put the snake at the base of the steps is he's going to stand guard. And anybody who enters into the place where the Buddha was teaching, if they had ill will towards the teachings, then the snake wasn't going to let them pass by. So this is the story that you hear related to the snake and why the snake is at the base of the stairs of entering into a temple complex. So again, I don't know whether this story is true or if it's false. I wasn't there when this was going on and I've never seen any snakes that can transition themselves to look like a human being. But I also know that scientists share with us that 99% of the animals that once existed in the world no longer exist, that what we're seeing today is only 1% of that. So that's why I say I don't have any independently verifiable proof that this is true, but I don't have any independently verifiable truth that it's false either. So I just share this story with you because we do have these statues at all these different temples and it can help you to remember certain things when you see this statue. The first thing that it can help you remember is thank goodness that you're human, that this is the ideal existence to be able to get to enlightenment because from the animal realm, you're unable to be able to get to enlightenment. And all of us have been reborn countless times. We've been in the animal realm several times, but now we're in this human realm and this is the ideal time to be able to get to enlightenment and we can make our way to enlightenment. So not allowing this life to breed complacency. Complacency would be where you're dull or lethargic or lackluster. You're not having enthusiasm and ambition and motivation to be able to make your way to enlightenment. You might kind of put off your meditation. You might put off reading that book. You might kind of not be interested in coming to class and kind of just pushing it away. This is very common as the mind is progressing to enlightenment that there can be some complacency that sets in. When the Buddha talks about complacency, he talks about it all the way to the level as if you were walking down the street and you had a unwholesome thought that came into the mind and you did nothing about it. This is actual complacency that the mind didn't have the wisdom and it didn't take the action. It didn't have the initiative to cut off that unwholesome thought and eliminate it from the mind. So that would be complacency. It's not just choosing not to meditate or choosing not to read books or come to classes. That's significant complacency. But the Buddha talks about complacency all the way to the level of if you have an unwholesome thought come into your mind and you do nothing about it, you don't cut it off and let it go, that the mind is actually complacent. So you can use this as a symbol of helping you to remember that, yes, thank goodness I'm in the human realm that I can now get to enlightenment. The next thing you can understand from this statue is you can understand that enlightened beings don't have any fear whatsoever, that the Buddha came over. He didn't have any fear of the snake because he knows that he didn't cause the snake any harm. And because he didn't cause any harm, there's no harm that's going to come to him. So all enlightened beings, they don't have any fear whatsoever. They would remove all the causes and conditions that were producing the fear, which is craving, desire, attachment, the longing and the yearning, wanting things to be a certain way. Whenever you're making decisions through that, it's going to produce unwholesome results in your life. And if that exists in your mind, there's going to be certain fears that come up in the mind. And then the third thing that you can understand from the statue is that whenever you're approaching the teachings of the Buddha, whether it's in books or classes or talking to a teacher, visiting a temple or anything like this, you would like to do that without ill will towards the teachings. Having ill will towards the teachings would be to be interested in changing the teachings because a Buddha is the discoverer, the declarer, the originator of the path to enlightenment. And whatever they've figured out to be able to get to enlightenment, that's what it's going to take for all humans to be able to get to enlightenment. In heavenly beings too, of course. But that path to enlightenment that a Buddha declares is how to actually get to enlightenment. And if you were to change those teachings, it's going to be for your harm and the harm of many people. Because a Buddha has figured out how to get to enlightenment. And essentially what they're doing through the course of their life is they're laying down lights along the path to enlightenment. 
illuminating this path, making it more and more clear for as many people that are interested and have a sincere interest to learn and practice to be able to get to enlightenment so that they can actually progress towards enlightenment. So these lights that are laid down along the path by a Buddha, if somebody was to come along and change the teachings, it's like basically knocking over those lights so that now there's not as much illumination of the path. And this is where you can veer off the path and become very confused, having misunderstandings and hinder you from being able to get to enlightenment. So if you were to have ill will towards Towards the teachings and you actually change the teachings, it's going to cause you harm because you're not going to be able to get to enlightenment when you start changing the teachings. Or if you change the teachings and you share this with other people, if they haven't been learning to be able to learn, reflect, and practice and independently verify the teachings, if they just believe what it is that you're sharing, they're not going to be able to get to enlightenment either because they're going to be doing certain things in their practice that isn't the actual path to enlightenment. And now it makes it more and more difficult for all of humanity to be able to get to enlightenment. So these are the three things that you can remember from this particular statue is one is thank goodness that you're in the human realm. Don't be complacent. Use this as an opportunity for you to get to enlightenment. Enlightened beings don't have any fear that you would have eliminated all the causes and conditions that produce fear. And I teach that in this particular program in chapter 17. And then the third thing is that you don't have ill will towards the teachings. It would be very unwise to have ill will towards the teachings because it's just going to cause harm to you and to countless other people. So let me know if you guys have questions on this one. You can put it into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or you can raise your hand in Zoom and ask any questions that you like. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions anywhere. So I'm going to move into the last one here. This is actually another representation of enlightenment itself. This is a leaf here that is on this particular tree. This tree in the middle is the actual tree where the Buddha sat and contemplated for seven weeks. Of course, he came and went at different times. He needed to eat and things like that, but he contemplated at this tree after he got to enlightenment because his journey to enlightenment was a six-year journey from the age of 29 until the age of 35. And when he got to enlightenment at the age of 35, he knew that his mind was enlightened because he knew that the mind was peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. He no longer experienced any bitterness or harshness or hostility. He had this deep wisdom of what it took to get to enlightenment. The mind's stable and steady. It's unshakable. There's focus, clarity, concentration. There's deep memory. You'll notice that your personal and professional relationships are really blossoming. They're at ease. You won't even be in a bad mood anymore by the time you get to enlightenment. So the Buddha knew that he had discovered what it took to get to enlightenment, and he did this by himself, so he knew he was an actually a Buddha. But he also was aware that people in the community were sharing teachings that were completely opposite of what it was that he was sharing. What he knew and what he understood that it took to get to enlightenment was very different than what other people were teaching. Other people were teaching to hang themselves upside down from trees, to lay on beds of nails, to pierce the body with metal implements, to starve the body. The thought was that if you could cause pain to the physical body and your mind could overcome that pain, that then you would be able to get to enlightenment. There's actually even people teaching these kinds of things today. If you've ever been in a meditation class and there is pain in the body and the teacher said, oh, just breathe through the pain, you know, overcome it with the mind. This is essentially the same thing. You're never interested in causing intentional physical pain to the body in that situation the body is explaining to you that hey you know there's a problem here in your hip or your knee and it would be wise to change positions so that you don't cause damage to the body so the buddha knew that other people were teaching these kinds of things and it was, they, they were claiming that those were the teachings that it took to get to enlightenment but his teachings were radically different than this and he wasn't sure whether the world was ready for the teachings that he had to share. So he sat at this tree and spent time around this tree for about seven weeks contemplating of what he should do, whether he should go back to the royal palace or whether he should go share his teachings. Well, we know ultimately that he did decide to share his teachings and that's why we're learning them today and that's why we know that they lead to enlightenment. 2,500 years later, his teachings are still available here so that you can now learn and practice and be able to get to enlightenment. But because he sat at this tree for a period of time and he actually got to enlightenment just prior to coming here, this tree is designated as a tree where he actually attained enlightenment. 
happened, that prior to his death, about three months before, his students were informed that he was going to be dying. This is how enlightened he was, that he knew the exact moment when he was going to die, essentially. He gave people a three months heads up that he was going to be dying. And when he notified his students of this, they asked him what they should do when people are coming to visit him. Because if you can imagine during the lifetime of a Buddha having taught for 45 years, there was lots and lots and lots of students. And a lot of these students were actually enlightened and they would come and still pay their respect to the Buddha and thank him or you know, talk to him about different things. So he had all these visitors that would come and see him for various reasons, even current students or new students that were not yet enlightened to come ask him questions. So when his students were informed that he was going to die, they asked him, you know, what should we do when all these visitors are coming to visit you and you're not going to be here? And the Buddha said, well, if people come to visit me and they would like to do something to kind of rise dedication and diligence in their mind, then there's these four sites that you could actually visit in order to be able to rise this dedication and this diligence in the mind. And he suggested that if you visited the place where he was born, if you visited this tree, which is denoted as essentially the location where he attained enlightenment, even though he attained enlightenment over a six-year period, this tree is designated as the location where he attained enlightenment because he sat there and spent time for about seven weeks contemplating whether or not to share his teachings or not, that people could visit this tree. They could visit the location where he gave his first discourse, his very first teaching, and they could visit the location that he actually died. So these are the four sites that an individual might visit if they're interested in a rising dedication and diligence and ambition on the path to enlightenment. His birth location, the place where is attributed to him having attained enlightenment, his location of his first discourse, and then the location where he actually died. These are places that you can go visit today. They're in Northeast India. So this particular tree, we refer to it as a Bodhi tree. And the leaf of this tree is here pictured. And this tree is a symbol of enlightenment as well. You can see this very large base that it has. And then it has this little, almost like a hair going up over here and kind of going off into the distance and rising up. This is a symbol of enlightenment itself because of its association with the Buddha having contemplated at this tree. We refer to it as a Bodhi tree in English, but there's other ways to refer to it as well. So let me know what questions you guys have on this. You can put that into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom. And then also, I'm just going to open up to any and all questions that you guys have, whether it's related to anything that I've shared today or any other aspect of the path to enlightenment. If you have any of those kinds of questions, you're more than welcome to ask anything and everything that you'd like by putting that into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or raising your hand in Zoom. Okay, it looks like Kristen has a question. Go ahead, ma'am. Yeah, you may have covered this, but I just had a really quick question on the imagery of the the symbol where it has the um, rebirth cycle and it moves through and comes up, and and also the one with the lotus flower. There's those little dots at the top, and I was just curious what those represented. Yeah, these are from the artists themselves. It looks like this one on the right. It looks like if I can see it properly, there's four little dots there. I, yeah. would, I would say that that represents the four stages of enlightenment. That's what I would interpret it as. But someone else might say, oh, that represents the four noble truths. But because it's moving upward and your mind's becoming more and more enlightened and you can see it starts with a larger circle and then getting smaller and smaller, this is representing, in my opinion, the pollution of the mind. And now it's becoming smaller and smaller and diminishing until you actually get to the fourth stage of enlightenment where the mind's completely purified and enlightened. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Was there another one here you said you had a question about? Yeah, there was just on the lotus flower too. There was a dot on top of that one. Um, oh, this yeah, one here. I'm okay. Yeah. Yeah, this could be representing enlightenment itself, or someone might say it represents the third eye. You know, different people will interpret these things different ways. That's one of the fun things about looking at artwork. It's really the artist that knows 100%, but this is one of the fun things is kind of looking at artwork and trying to figure out what was it that the artist was trying to communicate. Okay, thank you, David. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, I'm going to look one more time, see if we have any questions anywhere. Here we go. Looks like Vibhav has a question. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, David. I had a question on not the imagery, but the 
I know you talked about the differences between the uh, different stages of enlightenment when, when from first stage when you go to second stage you have significantly reduced uh, sensual desire and so is if, if somebody gets to the first stage and then from then on they are uh, doing all the work to do the meditation and working on and uh, even getting a better understanding of the Eightfold Path and working towards. So is that kind of the only thing they experience is like just the decrease sense of desire? Um, and like what what does it take from getting getting from like the, say the first stage of enlightenment to second stage or second to third stage? Because there's not a lot of stuff written on it. So what is it like from a, from persons? Yeah. Sure. So getting to the first stage of enlightenment, an individual is going to have essentially under their belt and having wrapped their arms around all the teachings that they need to be able to get to enlightenment. They're not fully practicing them and they may not even fully understand them 100%, but they at least have gathered all the teachings that they need. They have a teacher. You're not going to just stumble your way into the first stage of enlightenment. You know, they have a teacher, someone who's guiding them. They have a collection of the teachings at their fingertips. They've been actively learning and practicing. They're understanding the Eightfold Path really deeply and they've eliminated those first three fetters of personal existence view wrong behavior and observances and doubt all those three fetters are completely eliminated and because of the work that they've done at this point having moved through the jhanas and gotten to that first stage of enlightenment their discontentedness would be significantly diminished and they will have seen that that what they once experienced when they were off the path to enlightenment versus in that first stage of enlightenment there is a fraction of the amount of discontentedness that once existed before so now going from that first stage of enlightenment to the second stage because they already have all the baseline teachings that they need and they've already wrapped their arms around that they're just continuing to practice the teachings on a day-to-day basis very closely and they're working on eliminating all the fetters especially central desire and ill and ill will those are two very strong fetters and then of course in the higher fetters there's conceit so it's wise to be working on that all the way through so as they make their way to the second stage of enlightenment they no longer have as strong of central desire and ill will as they once had in that first stage of enlightenment they'll still have central desire and ill will but moving into the second stage they would have thinned out the central desire and ill will But now to get from the second stage to the third stage, they would have completely eliminated sensual desire and ill will. And while it sounds like going from a thin sensual desire and ill will to none whatsoever, that might sound like a trivial thing, but it's actually quite challenging because there's so many sensual desires in the mind of an unenlightened being. There's a lot of work that needs to go into eliminating those sensual desires. And as you're eliminating the sensual desire, the ill will will naturally start to decrease, but there's actually things you need to go in and actively do in order to eliminate the ill will like practicing loving kindness meditation and practicing loving kindness in day-to-day life through your intention speech and actions so there's a lot of work to do there to thin out and eliminate central desire and ill will those are very strong fetters and now once you've completely eliminated the central desire and ill will because the first three are already eliminated the personal existence view the doubt the wrong behavior and observance is already eliminated now the mind is going to move into that third stage of enlightenment and as you're doing this and you're progressing forward you're going to notice this significant decreasing and diminishing of discontentedness more and more as you're making your way through those stages of enlightenment even moving into the jhanas you're going to notice a reduction of discontentedness as well thank you Mm -hmm. you're welcome okay i'm just going to take a look here see if we have any more questions anywhere Okay, I'm not seeing anything anywhere. So what I'm going to do is just thank all of you guys for attending today's class. And at the same time, thank you for understanding that I'm traveling and not able to teach all the classes. I'm making an effort to do that. But there's some cases where there's not an internet connection or maybe I'm late on a bus or there's in an airport or something like that. And I'm just not able to actually teach a particular class. I think I've missed maybe two or three classes so far since I've been traveling. I only have about another week and a half to be traveling and I'll be back in Chiang Mai where I can be consistently teaching on a regular basis like I typically do but just 
Thank you so much for understanding the impermanent nature of your teacher, that I am impermanent and I'm not always going to be permanently able to teach classes the way that I typically do regularly teach classes and consistently, but impermanence is going to affect the classes as well. It affects all things. So thank you guys for understanding that impermanence as I'm traveling around. So as I do travel around, if I am experiencing any impermanence where I can't teach, I will put a post in the Facebook group with a recorded class of that class that I actually missed because all these classes that I'm teaching, I've taught them and recorded them at some point. And most of the times I've recorded them countless times, several times, so that you'll be able to get access to a recording that is the intended live class so that that way you can still keep your progress going and your growth growing on the path to enlightenment. So thank you for understanding the travel and the impermanence and thank you for your dedication and diligence to learning and practicing the teachings. Next week, we're going to be in chapter 24 of our book, Developing a Life Practice, The Path That Leads to Enlightenment. This chapter is titled Misunderstandings of the Teachings. And in this chapter, I'm going to go through several misunderstandings that you're going to see related to the teachings of the Buddha, that as you're out there in the world, whether it's in Facebook groups or reading books or even visiting temples and talking with teachers and ordained practitioners, there's countless misunderstandings that are out there in the world. And I'm going to be discussing some of the major ones so that that way you can understand that as you're out there, you're going to be able to learn, reflect, and practice to be able to see the truth for yourself. Because not everybody has been taught the same way as you. They haven't always been taught to learn, to reflect, to independently verify, and practice the teachings. So some people are just believing certain things, and this is being put out into the world. And by you understanding these misunderstandings in a way that you can learn, reflect, and practice, you can come to the truth and know the truth about these things. So that as you're encountering any kind of misunderstandings, that you'll then be able to know what the truth is, even though you might be encountering something in a book or in a class or a course or a retreat or at a temple or any of these kinds of things. So that's what we'll be doing next Sunday. Of course, we have the Pali Canon and English study group, and we have the meditation on Wednesdays that you're always welcome to join that as well, where I usually do meditation with students and then open up to any and all questions that you like. So thank you again for joining, and perhaps we'll see you guys in a future class. Have a very lovely and wonderful rest of your day. We'll see you next time. Sawadee Thank you for listening to this podcast. To provide support for this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha. To access more teachings, visit buddhadailywisdom.com. There, you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Remember to establish a daily, consistent meditation practice, along with learning and practicing these teachings. A well-developed meditation practice is the foundation in which to train the mind to attain enlightenment.